Before we begin, we're going to have your, um, your principal, uh, Ms. Tindall, she's going to say a few words. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so this is a great opportunity. Dr. Emden actually spoke to us as adults during our convocation ceremony. And we were absolutely inspired by his message. Uh, he, I've talked to him a little bit, so he has the same or similar message for you all today. Um, it really is about authenticity, being yourself, um, and the role of hip hop in education. Um, this is a really rare event. Um, and I want to make sure you know the significance of um, someone of Dr. Emden, Emden's uh, intellectual stature. Uh, and his passion coming to speak to you today. So I definitely want to just remind you um, that we're tech prep and we're always kind um, and we're attentive and we are happy about this opportunity, right? So I'm just gonna turn it over to Dr. Emden and let him have the stage. Let's give him a round of applause and welcome him. Good afternoon, everyone. I need more of a response than that. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's, it's definitely um, a pleasure to share some words with you guys today. I know you didn't get my bio or who I am, so I'll give you a quick introduction to who I am and then, um, and then what I do, and then sort of get into the talk and the conversation I want to have with you. So I'm Chris Emden. I spoke to a, bu a bunch of the teachers and, and adults probably like a couple months. How long was that, guys? Do you remember? In August, so a, little, a little while ago. And um, after I shared some words with them, um, I figured I'd share those same conversations with you guys a little bit on a very different level. Um, I don't want this to be like a, like a speech per se where somebody's just coming to spit information at you. I want it to be more of a dialogue, so I'm gonna open up the space afterwards to have a conversation with you about, about some of the ideas I'm putting forth. Um, so the, the title of what I wanna talk to you guys about is called this idea of embracing hybridized identity. So the notion of hybridized identities is like a, it's like a complex word. So I'm going to ask you to repeat the word after me. So hybridized. hybridized. Louder. Hybridized. hybridized. And who knows what the word hybridized means? Anybody? Or the word hybrid. What does hybrid mean? <laughs> Say it louder. Like a mix. So for me, like, I, I always pride myself on this idea of understanding what it means to be a hybrid, a mix. So hybridized, from a scientific perspective, is when you take two different things of different sort of domains, you bring them together, you mix them up, something else pops off, and then that's a good thing. So that's a hybrid. Um, I view myself in many ways as a hybrid. And I feel like the stuff I've been able to do in my work, like in my career as a scientist and an educator, is because of me adopting this hybridized identity. So, for a living, I'm a professor at Columbia at Teachers College, and I'm also a fellow at Harvard doing some work in the, the hip-hop archive over there. And I also work with the Department of Energy as a Minorities and Energy Ambassador, and um, I work with the Department of State as a STEM Outreach Ambassador. So when people hear those terms, those phrases about what I do or what I've been asked to do, they oftentimes don't expect to see a face that looks like mine, or they don't expect to see somebody that has the same kind of background I have, right? So. Um, the idea of you know, an Ivy League professor who does some work, if you just say that definition of what that person is, they don't see me. Um, but beyond all those titles, I always pride myself on just being Chris from, from the hood, right? So I'm still who I am. And the reason I've been able to do that is because it took some effort to be able to navigate that. And so I just want to give a little bit of an insight into how I've been able to form my identity to help me to do the things that I've been able to do. Um, and also be honest with you guys about that process. So I remember being in the 10th grade, maybe 11th grade, I don't remember what year. It was Black History Month. This dude was invited to come to the school. He sat in the back of the, of the um, he sat in the front of the auditorium. I, of course, was not really about listening to some dude, so I sat all the way in the back. He got up there and was talking about Black History Month and like how we should all focus on black history. And he named a whole bunch of folks who were like iconic figures in the world of black America. He was like, you know, what about Benjamin Banneker? You should be more like Benjamin Banneker. And he said all these things, and he probably had good intentions, but as I heard what he was saying, I'm like, yo, son, I'm like, I'm really not about that life. I say son because I'm from New York. Like, it just doesn't sound about what he was saying didn't appeal to me in many ways, right? And as I got older and went through life, like in my head, I already had visions of what I wanted to do. And who that dude was on that stage didn't really speak to who I wanted to do. 
Um, what I wanted to be at the time was, like, I wanted to be a rapper. Like, that was my whole goal in life. So all through high school, every battle I was there, every cypher I was there, that was my entire mission. That had nothing to do with what I'm doing now, which is a scientist and does scientific research and sociological research. But anybody said something to me at the time about science, I'd be like, whatever, I'm not really with that. You know, where the cypher at? And so as he was speaking at that moment, all I could think about were my goals. And so my goals were these things in front of you, right? Like, they were talking about getting into college, and I was like, when will I ever get a chance to meet Nas? I'm like, yo, I want to just be in a cypher and ride with Nas. If I ever ride with Nas, that's what I want to do. So he's like, go to college. You guys want to be like Benjamin Banneker? And this is not saying anything about Benjamin Banneker in particular. He's an idol um, of mine now. But at the time, I was like, man, Benjamin Banneker don't know Nas. I don't want to go talk to him. So, th so that was one of my goals, right? The second goal of mine was to be like in Wu-Tang. So I don't know if any got you guys, you know, I'm a little older than y'all, so Wu-Tang's right, my favorite hip-hop group of all time, right? Somebody else give me a shout out over there. And so I was like, yo, I gotta be the, somebody threw the W's up. I was like, I wanna be an extra member of Wu-Tang. Like, that was my goal. So everything this guy was saying meant nothing to me because he had nothing to do with Wu-Tang. Um, and then the other one was to meet Antoine Fisher. And I was like, I just heard about the story of this guy who was, um, uh, you know, was adopted and he went through so much stuff and he, he, he had a different way in life. And that story always spoke to me because I have three younger brothers and my younger brothers are my adopted brothers. And they had a very challenging background before they came into our family. So I always wanted to meet like Antoine Fisher. Anything to do with Antoine Fisher, I was really just about that. Um, the fourth one was really powerful. It was based on a 10th grade experience where one of my teachers was like, Chris, you know, you're always disrupting my class. Like, you're never going to be able to do anything successful. And I was like, well, because I was a small mouth. So I was like, well, what you doing so successful? What are you doing is teaching us, right? And he, was, he got up. And he was like, what have I done successful? You don't know what brought me here. I've been to the White House. And as soon as he said I've been to the White House, the whole class was like, well, he been to the White House, so he kind of shut me down. So in my head, I was like, one day I'm going I'm to spit bars on the White House steps and prove to him that I could get there, right? And then the final thing that I had in my goal in mind, which is a little bit more academic, was I always wanted to be in the New York Times because the New York Times, you know, when I was growing up, they always had this like music session, section, and that music section always featured like these amazing artists and it was like a, a profile on the artist and it was like all these things these folks got to do. And I was like, you know what? When I become a rapper, I'm going to be able to do all those things. So my life has gone on and passed by, and like maybe about a year and a half ago, this happened. I'm at Harvard, archive, we're chilling, and Nas walks in, and he like says, hey, Chris Emden, and we're having a conversation. I was like, oh my god, like, I thought I was going to be, I thought that the way that I would ever get to meet Nas was to rap for him. And now I'm meeting him in this role as an academic, which is bugged, but I'm like, that's one of my goals I always wanted to meet. And then, of course, Wu-Tang, I don't know if you guys know this, but this is Jizzle from the Wu-Tang Clan. Yeah, it might not be nothing to you, means the world to me. You know, we got another Jizzle fan in here. But I got a chance to, to have a conversation with Jizzle, which is amazing. I'm like, oh my God, I'm, these are like the goals I was having when I was in 11th grade. Like, I'm meeting these goals, right? And Anton so Fisher, Derek, um, you know, so I'm, I'm meeting all these people in the White House blog, and I was in the New York Times, and all these kind of crazy things. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, how is it that I was able to accomplish all these things that in my head at the time were the biggest things? Right? Like, later on in life, people would say, well, the, the big thing that you've done is that you're a professor and you've done all this work. But to me, those weren't the things that meant a lot. What meant a lot were these, like, small things, meeting these folks. And I started thinking about what is it that made me go from that kid who's in the back of the class who didn't care what was going on to the dude who was able to meet all his, go all his goals. And I realized at the time that I got to that point, when I started understanding that I could be a hybrid, this idea of hybridized identity. Say hybridized. hybridized. One more time, hybridized. So what do I mean by hybridized? What do I mean by identity? Identity and hybridized identity is like what it is that you become. So oftentimes, based on how you look, how you dress, where you come from, how you speak, etc., people have perceptions of who you are. And when people have perceptions of who you are, because of the way society is set up, I feel like Kevin Hart, the way my bank account is set up. Anyway, because of the way that society is set up, we have a likelihood to sometimes pick an identity and then stick to that identity for the rest of our lives. So for me, like, the first time I stepped into a cypher and, I, and I'd spit, and they were like, yo, he's nice. Like, from that moment on, I knew that I was just going to be a rapper. And so at that point, why, why you making faces like I can't spit? Like, right? she, she didn't try to flame it. So, for example, just, just to shut you down right quick, right? If I had a cypher, I would spit something like, yo, um, um, 
Um, um, Vaughn's. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I would say, yo, may I have your attention? I'm toting extreme lyrical weapons plus rocking a suit equipped with generic MC deflection. So any MC in the house run like the Reverend or you gonna see hella heaven in less than 11 seconds. It's like, it's like, just, just, that was just because you tried to play me. But hold up, so that, that's, that's, that's lyrics and that's rap. And that's what I was, that was what I was equipped to do for a very long time, right? Because that's what a lot of people saw me at. So every time they were like, just spit, just spit. I just spit those bars. But at one point in my life, I realized that because I had the skill to be able to spit those bars and that cypher, it meant that I could also have the skill set to be able to be like, why not apply that to something else? So instead of spitting those bars, I could say, yo, I'm a physicist, lyricist, spitting this ridiculousness, so witness the ignorance I dismiss. Oh my God! Nuance, mass, emotion is a topic of the course. Cause things in motion, stay in motion, unless they hit an imbalanced force. So hold up. The next up is the second law of situation and summation. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's the second law, the new force law. So if you want more than the third law is in store, uh. So every force has an opposite force and every action has an equal plus opposite reaction. The sum of all objects at rest is zero unless that object is no longer relaxing. I'm in emotion, that's change in location. So it hits traction, a coefficient of friction. Then it all comes to a full stop. And there goes no laws over hip hop, but hold up, I'm off Newton. I'm on an Einstein. I like Einstein because Einstein's mind is like mine. His, his formula was E equals MC squared, which is weird because me is a favorite MC squared. Yeah, so that was light, but the point of me spitting that bar is not to show I could spit. It's to showcase something very important. I want y'all to, to, to follow me here. What's important I'm trying to showcase is that the same skill set that let me be in a cypher and kill a cypher and spit bars like that was the same skill set that I could combine with being a scientist and when I put the two together, it actually made me a doper scientist. When I talk to you guys about hybridized identities to understand that you don't have to pick what you want to do, that you can actually be more successful in life if you pick two things that people don't see the connections between and make that who you want to be. And that's important given where we are right now, because it's Black History Month, right? Yes, sir. And in Black History Month, it's important to note that, so this, look at this screen. I don't know if y'all really see that, because it's light in the back, but that's like a Jeopardy screen, right? You see the last category? category? What's the last category over there? African American History. So this is actually from a real Jeopardy game, right? Cats are out there on Jeopardy, playing the game. They had a bunch of questions. They answered every single question on the board, and we're done. And the only category, you remember that? The only category that was left was African American history. And as that topic was left, all three of them was looking at each other like, nope, you do it, nope, you do it. Like nobody wanted to go there. And I think it's important for us to really go there today. Because this idea that I've talked about of hybridized identity, that's the same construct that every single person who has made an impact in the world that is African American has embraced. This idea of taking people who you thought could not do something or you relegated them to just being able to do one thing, and then when they mixed it up and it became a hybrid, they were dope. So I'm gonna give you two historical lessons. Are you ready for a historical lesson? Is that I? Some said no, some said yeah, you just wanna hear more bars. Um, but two lessons real quick. Who here has heard of this guy named Thomas Fuller? Anybody? Like a few people. But I want y'all to understand how the idea of spitting science bars, mixing hip hop and science, was been a part of African American history for the longest time. So Thomas Fuller was this dude who was a slave. Right there is his obituary. He lived from 1710 to 1790. And when you tell the story of his life, the first few lines was died, Negro Tom. I gotta use an obituary voice, excuse me. <clears throat> died, Negro Tom. The famous African calculator, age 80 years. He was a property of Mrs. Elizabeth Cox of Alexandria. Tom was a very black man. They didn't even say he was a black man, he was very black and he was brought to this country at the age of 14. And then you go on and you hear all this stuff about this dude named Thomas Fuller. And if you read his story, when they say he was a slave, he was a property of someone, and that's the story about him, you would think certain things about him, right? Like one, would you think he could read or write? No, and the reality was, guess what? Thomas Fuller could not read or write. However, when, when he was outside of the places where they were judging him for reading or writing and he was in the slave quarters, think about the slave quarters as like your hood once you leave the school. 
And when you're in the hood, in the street court, like people who are in those spaces actually know who you are, right? So when they were in the, in the slave quarters, they talked to Tom and they'd be asking him questions and he's spitting out all these science and math facts. But they're like, so you're smart. But when they got him in front of the, of the, of the slave masters and stuff, they, the only way they judged him was because he couldn't read or write. So to figure this out, there's this dude who can't read or write, but when he's in his hood, he's spitting science to all his folks, right? So one day, they're like, you know what, this guy, we heard, they, we heard that he's a, a mathematician. Let's prove him wrong. So they get Thomas Fuller, get him out of the slave quarters, put him on the stage. So imagine he's on stage, like right where I'm standing, right? And he's standing right there, and next to him they have the smartest scientists and mathematicians of that time. And obviously those mathematicians and scientists are not black or slaves like Thomas Fuller, right? So he's up there, and let's say throughout a question, like calculate the amount of days, hours, weeks, in from 1714 to 1718. And all of a sudden, them folks who's on the stage with them, they got their pens, their papers, their calculators, and they're calculating, because they could write. So they go ham, like calculating, right? And it's like five or six of them. And then Thomas Fuller's sitting there, and what's he doing while they're, while they're calculating? Nothing, because ain't nothing he can't do, because technically, this dude can't read or write, right? So they're going, they're going, they're calculating, and all of a sudden, one of the guy's answers, he puts his hand up, he's like, I've got the answer, and then he yells out the answer. Then another dude, because you know that, that's what always happens, when one person got the answer, everybody all of a sudden got the answer. Another dude comes up, he's like, oh, I got the answer too, I got the answer too. And the dude who said the answer, they were all saying the same answer, and what's Thomas Fuller doing the whole time? Just chilling in the cut, because like he technically he can't read or write, he can't do anything, right? And then all of a sudden he, he stands up and he says, respectfully, I disagree with the answers to your questions. Now can you imagine, so dude is a slave, like he can't read or write, and he's saying, I disagree. So all of a sudden it's like a moment. It, like, it's like, it's like a world star moment when Starkeisha got hit. Like, everybody's like, you know, the whole, the whole crowd is like, oh, right? Like, it's a bad event. And they're like, oh, man, this dude's about to get it, right? And then they're like, so what do you mean you have to answer? And Thomas Fuller's like, um, your answers would have been correct, but you forgot to account for the fact that leap years exist within that time, right? So this dude is operating on a level that they're not even imagining. Mind you, he can't read or write. You guys who are in front of me today, and this is why I'm doing this work and giving these kind of speeches, are the modern day Thomas Fullers. Why? If Thomas Fuller couldn't read or write and he was judged because he was black and he was judged because he was from a certain neighborhood, he was judged because he was a slave, you guys have to understand that those same judgments come with you by society, right? It may be from where you come from, how you dress, how you look, and they can look at you and they can identify what you're supposed to be and, and what a, an inscription of an identity, like they give you an identity based on what they think you are. But they don't know that when you're back in the hood, you spitting bars, just like Thomas Fuller when he was back in those trenches, can do the math problems off the top. In fact, the fact that he could do it in his mind without being able to read or write actually proves that he has more scientific and mathematical ability than those who have a pen and paper. Y'all understand me? All of y'all right now, are the modern day Thomas Fullers who have the ability to have hybridized identities. That you could be hip hop and scientific at the same time. That's what I do, I'm a scientist and mathematician. Or you could dress fly and still get good grades at the same time. That you could be a dancer and an artist and still have mathematical prowess. And unless you guys start understanding at this age early on that you don't have to pick who you want to be, you're going to lose out on opportunities to be truly great. Y'all feel me? So that's one example of Thomas Fuller. Second example, Harriet Tubman. Who's heard of Harriet Tubman? If, oh, like one person didn't raise their hand. We're gonna have that history lesson later on. But Harriet Tubman, what do we know Harriet Tubman for? Underground Railroad, what else? Free the slaves. Now, the fact that, no, she's on point. The fact that Harriet Tubman is known only for freeing the slaves is a good thing, except for the fact that Harriet Tubman was a woman who, without having the ability to take advanced science and math classes, was doing advanced scientific and mathematical work. She was sitting there, right there, in the middle of just dark night skies looking at stars and figuring out where Polaris is, where the North Star is, using the North Star to guard the, 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 the slaves north, understanding the ecological surroundings where she's at. Like, she's understanding so much deep constructs. Now, when people describe Harriet Tubman as just a person who freed the slaves, guess what they're doing? They are giving her a singular identity, 
when she actually has a hybridized identity. I want y'all to get my point. I'm going to hit y'all with that idea again. And by doing that, what are they doing? They are actually, in many ways, giving her less of a legacy than she actually is. Right? And so what I'm asking y'all to do today is, in order for you to be able to undo what they did to Harriet Tubman, you've got to actually mix the identities together. And for folks of color, particularly black young people, that's part of who we are in our DNA. So here's my last example, which I love this example. It's just me. Y'all see those images? Can we get them lights again so they can see it? What do you guys see there? <laughs> now, I, I know how you react and how you're looking. Like, you're like, okay, they got no shirts on, they're sitting there. But let's watch what they do. Hold up. So y'all don't know what the heck is going on, right? What is he doing? He's teaching the uh, like the, the older kid is teaching the younger kid something, right? And he's literally on, right in that moment teaching them how to count. These are kids who've never been to school teaching each other how to count. Now, what's bugged out about it is this. If you listen to those words, you hear something really interesting. The words rhyme. Like, the word, like each word that he's describing actually rhymes with the previous word. Like, so, in essence, what I'm knowing what rap is, reading or writing is, they're actually rhyming to teach each other. Beyond that also, they actually did something with this clip that challenged a whole bunch of thinking of scientists and mathematicians. Because usually when we count, we count from 1 to 10. And 10 is a base number, right? They are actually counting from 1 to 26. Like, 26 words. Now, how many characters are there in the alphabet? 26. They are actually using alphanumeric values to describe a numerical construct. That, I, you know, that is just next level. Like, there are, there are historians and mathematicians who don't understand how they had the skill set to be able to make that connection. But just by virtue of not having anything, they can do this. Now, if we judge them just based on the narrative of what we saw, what would we see? Some poor African kids who ain't got nothing or might be trying to learn. But what they are to scientists and mathematicians today as they analyze them is a group of people who have more complex thinking than anyone else. Because if you look at it from the lens of seeing more than what you see, there's more to it. And what I'm asking y'all to do is just that. So last clip, because I got to drive the points home, you know what I mean? Um, is, to, is to really talk about my research a little bit. So as a professor, part of my work is to be able to identify the skills of scientists, right? So one of my projects was, Professor Emden, we want you to be able to identify all the skills of the most prolific scientists of our time, right? So they told me to go research all these scientists. Who do you think they picked? Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. That's my shoulder off on that. Nah, not me. Um, Einstein, Nguyen, of course. All these cats, right? So Einstein, Nguyen, Niels Bohr, all these amazing scientists. And so I look at all these scientists, I look at all their work, look at all their history, and I'm supposed to identify what made them brilliant scientists. So I'm looking, I'm analyzing their words, their text, the things that they said to other people, and a couple of things start coming up. One, they all had keen observation skills. One, they were very analytical. They spoke a metaphor and analogy. The, um, they, the way they described their ideas was very, very nuanced. They were anti-authoritarian. All these really complex words. So I write this paper and they're like, oh my God, this is great because you can tell me how all these folks are brilliant scientists. Then my, nast, my next task was, yo, Emden, since you'd be able to do this work, go find a population in the United States that has the same skill set as these most brilliant scientists. So you know, I get up there and I start researching and guess who those people were? Huh? Africans? That's one of the characteristics. European. European was not quite one of the characteristics. The group or population that has the most skill set aligned to the most brilliant scientists of our time were rappers. You think I'm bugging? Right, I know, that's what they said to me too. Right, how so? I'll tell you how so. So if a brilliant scientist had keen observation skills, like when Jay-Z was dissing Nas, he said, dog, you never lived it, you witnessed it from your folk's pad, you scribbled in a notepad, you created your life. Essentially what he was saying was, you were able to sit at a window and watch and analyze things deeply. That's the same skill set of a research scientist. 
Speaking of metaphor and analogy, the best rappers that we know, when they spit bars, they're like, this is like something else. Like they're always comparing something to something else. And that's the same skill set of the prolific sciences. Um, being analytical, being anti-authoritarian, pretty much every skill that the most brilliant scientists in the world ever had, we find amongst rappers. So the question is, how come all these rappers ain't scientists then? Why? Because they nobody told them they were scientists. Because they never believed that they were scientists. Because society viewed them as being having a single identity just based on who they are. Right? That's why I'm here to get like send this. Like I heard already, like just speaking. I don't know who dude is in the back there. Like every time I say something, he's saying something else. Like he's he's being smart in like a smart, like, oh you think you smart kind of way. But, but, but everything that he's saying is really insightful and reflective, which to me is an indication of an inner Thomas Fuller just waiting to get out. If you would use that same mindset to connect to your academics, you, you'd be killing them. And here's what's interesting to know. In any field that I've known, in any field of study, anybody who combines what they do with an understanding of, of urbanness and hip-hopness is better. For example, you could be a person who's a historian. You got a PhD in history. You're a history professor. They love you because you know everything, right? Once you're a history professor who has the ability to understand how it is to work and navigate the hood, spit bars, and you spit your history work, give speeches in a way that engages people, you become a superstar historian. If you're an urban planner, you're an urban planner that understands urbanness, you become a better urban planner. Once you combine what they give us, I don't want to get too, you know what I mean, but once you combine what they give you, like by getting an education, with what you already know naturally, just by being in and from the hood and being from hip hop, and you put those two things together, you become the best at any field that you're in. But sometimes we lock ourselves out of being the mixing because we're too busy trying to do one thing. For every rapper I know that's dope and has made it, there's like 100,000 rappers who I know that got skills that can't make it to that level. However, from every professor that I know that's average, but really is about the life of understanding the hood, he's more successful. And so for me, like, you got to be able to mix them up and be, what's the word? Starts with an H. Okay, y'all following a little bit. I'll get you there at some point. So I'm going to close off. By, oh, this is important to know also. Not only am I just saying it culturally, but as a scientist, we've actually hooked up fMRIs, which are fre frequency magnetic resonance instruments, to the brains of people while they're rapping to see what parts of the brain get activated. And as they're rapping and freestyling and engaging in hip hop, we found that the parts of the brain that control learning, attentiveness, and being curious are activated. Meaning as you spit bars, like let's say I spit bars about a science concept, not only am I understanding my science, I'm also learning the information better. And it's not just me saying it, it's actually proven by scientific research. Uh, I'm gonna close out soon because I know y'all wanna ask, ask questions. Um, it's, uh, um, so, essentially my, my method is always this. Whenever you see hip hop and you think of it as parental advisory explicit lyrics, that's what they tell us about what hip hop is. Hip hop is not parental advisory explicit lyrics. Hip hop is progressive educational content. You know what I mean? And let, let, me, let me add that to this idea of social media. Now I'm gonna just give you some, some information on the low, right? Social media is probably like, so who here got a Twitter? Just about everybody. Who here got an Instagram, right? Twitter and Instagram is actually the next wave of how you're able to show a hybridized identity. It's a, it's a way to carve out who you are. So uh, when I work now, we help and like, I, I, I'm part of a process of letting people into my university, an admissions process. And a lot of students don't know that part of the work of checking out who you're gonna get into the college, guess what we're doing now? Not just looking at your grades and all that. We're looking at your social media, your Twitter, your Facebook, whatever. Now, if your Twitter and your Facebook and your Instagram is all twerk videos and turn it up, I'm just saying, right? then that's the perception that they have of who you are. So right now, on the low, part of showing them that to be hip hop is not only a narrative that is negative, you can actually be wholeheartedly hip hop and also follow somebody that's educational, tweet something that's positive. Like, you can actually remix how they see you by using social media as the first step in remixing yourself. Y'all feel me? So my last, my last thing is just to share you a story about one of my boys, which like changed my life. Is this dude? Can I get the lights again, please? Um. Oh, I lost it. Oh, time's out. It's all right. Um. They're they're working on that. 
So we'll be alright, but I'll go through the story anyway. So there's this one dude, remember when I told you guys earlier about the fact that I always wanted to be in Wu-Tang? Yeah. So I'll tell you my first interaction with Jizza from Wu-Tang. So you would think that, as an aspiring rapper, I met Jizza like, maybe like in a street corner spitting verses, right? Absolutely not. The first time I met him was actually at the office of this guy named Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's probably one of the most brilliant scientists of our time. And so the question you asked is like, how the heck is Jizza the rapper, protect your neck, Wu-Tang playing nothing to F with, like what is he doing at Neil deGrasse Tyson's office? Well, the reality is that there's a perception of who he was that's very different from who he really is. So Jizza, I wish I could show that image, but it'll come back up. Jizza's this dude, like when you see him, he's intimidating. One of his most famous pictures is him just sitting there giving this evil look. And beyond that evil look, you go back and look at what he's really doing. He's actually into like neuroscience, neurobiology. And I mean, and, and I'm not neurobiology, astrobiology, astrophysics. And so I'm gonna close out with sharing y'all this, this final story, just to show y'all how brilliant y'all are, right? I did a project in New York where I went to a whole bunch of public schools and I asked the kids in the schools to write raps about science. And when I first did that, everybody looked at me like I was crazy, like, anybody wanna write no rhymes about science, fam? Like, who are you, right? And I'm like, just, just do it, we'll figure it out. So we went in there with the kids, the kids started writing these rhymes about science. And at first they were like, eh, then they started working on it, working on it. After a while, we started creating battles in the school, so the kids were spitting bars with each other about the science, right? So they wrote, wrote, wrote. At the end, we had a battle in this big stage, and this one kid won. And he was like, we call him the New York City Science Genius. So after I did this project, PBS heard about it. You know PBS, like Channel 13 and all that? They were like, we want to do our own version. Oh, it came back. Yeah, I almost, I almost jumped. Um, so that's, that's, that's Jizza, right? But, so that's him, and this is him in his rapper version, with what people expect him to be. And, but do you know that this dude, and this dude, is the exact same dude, same person? And so, the question becomes, how do you go from this to this? One, because this is not a full representation of who he is. Like, this was something that was done because, the, the label needed him to do something that was intimidating and, and like, and, like they're telling him like, dude, put the images up, growl a little bit more. And, and people are looking at this version of him and thinking that this is all that there is to him. And they do the same things to you. That's all I want you guys to understand. Like, the same way that people will look at this image and have a perception about who he is, like he's dangerous, he's angry, he's mad, and all that, this is what they do to you. And oftentimes what happens is, when people think about this about us for long enough, we start believing it ourselves. So you listen to somebody who thinks, like, you ever met somebody who he's coming off to you and he, he acting like he's super thug, and then you see him at home and he's holding his little brother and going to church, and you're like, fam, what, what happened between the two? It's not that something's wrong with him, it's that somebody has been feeding that dude who he's supposed to be or who is supposed to be his hero for so long that he's chasing something that he's not. And a lot of us are now in a problem, like now, 11th grade, 12th grade, trying to figure things out. You're chasing this image of people who people think you are, like, yeah, I'm trying to be fresh, trying to be fly. And my image to you is like, you can chase that image, but don't fall victim to it. And you can mix that up and go from this to that. And so my last story is, when PBS heard about our, our story, right, they actually ended up opening it up to the world. Like literally, scientists that got PhDs, you know, you have to be in science for so many years, conducting research, all that. And they said, you know what? Why don't you guys write raps about science? So I'm talking about people who have mad experience in science, right? So the kids, the, the, these PhDs wrote their science bars, right? And then we took their science bars and then we compared them to the rhymes that our ninth graders and 10th graders and 11th graders were writing. And guess what happened when we compared them? The level of intelligence and the level of brilliance of the science rap of the PhD level folks who went to college for like 13, 15 years. And the ninth and 10th graders are the exact same. You wanna know why? Because right now, each and every one of you actually has a skill set to do the science already. It's just a matter of turning it on and being cool with it. And if you do that, you have the skills already in you right now to be more brilliant than somebody that went to school for 15 years to do the same thing. If you realize that, you don't have to pick between one thing and the other, and you can just embrace your hybridized identity. So that's my talk with y'all. I'm done. I'm gonna answer some questions. Um, if you guys have any. If you have questions, come up and answer them. Don't be, don't be, don't be scared. Anybody got any questions, thoughts? Yeah. You come on up. First of all, I wanna say thank you for your time. I appreciate your conversation.
Yeah. So, girl, I'm like, tomorrow is the SAT for a lot of the 11th graders. Uh -huh. And I was actually in the classroom talking to them about the, how the SAT is structured. Right. So, in the concepts of what you're talking about, as far as hybridization, yeah. reading, yeah. and how it applies to that exam, can you give them some tips to how... Who's taking the SAT tomorrow? All of y'all? Look, what I want you guys to understand about those tests is, so one, those tests definitely will make a decision on how far you go as far as your careers are concerned. But really, what you have to understand about those tests is that it's really just a game. I know I'm saying like, it's serious, but it's a game. It's really a game. I wish I came in here early to talk to y'all like in September. Like, look. The SAT is just a game in resilience and resistance. Like, when you're taking a test, you're going to get to a point where you're going to be like, yo, all these damn words, I got to compare this to this, right? And at that point where you feel like you're most at the point where you're uncomfortable, that's the point where you really got to go in because they're counting on you giving up at that point. Like, that's the equivalent of Thomas Fuller on that stage. And he's on that stage, and they're asking him to give the answer. At that point, when them folks shouted the answer out, what do you think Thomas Fuller could have done? He could have been like, yo, it's a little too heavy, fam. Like, all right, y'all win, and I keep it moving. Or he's like, nah, this is the answer. So as you take that test tomorrow, you got to go in there with a mentality that you're going to be successful at it, right? And if you go in there with the right attitude, like this is just a game that I'm going to flip it, and then when I flip this, I'm going to go on to higher education and really kill them, that mindset is going to be enough to take you over that hump. Y'all going to be all right. It's, not, it's, a, it's a test. It's, it's not a marker of your intelligence. If you go there with the right attitude, you're going to be good. All right? Any other thoughts or questions? I, I'm seeing some of y'all. I almost see the wheels turning. Like, I see you thinking, which is a good thing. Yeah. That's fine. Only adults want to ask questions, which is good. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the usury of Harvard's That was the New York Times had like a yeah. thing. Yeah. I'm curious your opinion. Yeah. yeah. Now, nah, um, it's important to talk about. So, I, I saw a piece in the New York Times. I mean, look, let me, let me, let me, let me. Let, so y'all all know Bobby Shmurda. You know, at the, at the, listen, I am going to stunt. Like, if the song come on right now, I might start 272, right? But I want y'all to understand one thing. There's a, there's a, there was an article that, so first of all, y'all know Bobby Shmurda's locked up, right? Okay. Uh, he, he, he might possibly come out on bail, but this is what I want y'all to understand about Shmurda. And I'm not trying to hate on a young dude because he's from Brooklyn and I'm from Brooklyn, right? But I want you to understand one thing. What Shmurda did is essentially what I'm asking you not to do. Not in a bad way, right? But what he did was he started believing all that they said he should be. Like, so when he's spent talking about hit, hit a shot, hit a shot made, made his body twirl and all that kind of food, like all he's doing is he's trying to create more of what they want. So he got signed to Epic Records. They gave him a deal for technically $2 million, right? Now, he gets this $2 million uh, bill, and instead of understanding that there's more to me than just this one song, he goes out and gets caught up with some dudes who, with guns, whatever, and in New York with a gun, you're in for three years, automatic. And then beyond that, conspiracy charges and all that. Now, you would think that the company that's offering him a $2 million deal is going to bail him out, right? Hell no. Excuse my language. Right? Why? Because they understand that he's believed the narrative so long that that's nothing more to him than that. And out of that $2 million, guess what? They're going to A, recoup over them all, the, all the money that they gave them. And then after that, they're going to sue them. They're going to sue them because they ain't recoup their money. So after all that chasing this image, he ends up in a worse position than he was already in. Now, let me break this down real quick so you understand this. If Shmurda used that same skill to be able to write that song and also had the skill set to be able to get a degree, he would be killing it just on a speaking circuit. I'm, I'm here to keep a buck with you. Like if he had a degree and a, if he had a degree and a hot single, if he had a, he had a college degree and that same single, he would be able to do anything that he wanted. But because he didn't embrace a hybridized identity, that's why he's in the situation you're in right now. Like when I'm talking to y'all about all this stuff, like I'm not just, like I don't want to come up like some preacher dude. You know what I mean? Like I want to come up to you guys as a guy who I understand any and everything, anything you've been through, trust me, I've been through it. So I've been through, shoot, 11 people in an apartment in Brooklyn. Like, you know what I mean? Got to heat up the stove to get the apartment warm. I've been through that. That's light. Like, I've been through getting in fights. I've been through almost not graduating high school. And the minute that I 
the minute I understood that I can actually, I don't have to choose between the image and who I could be, the second I understood that, I was able to accomplish all my goals as a young person and more goals than I could ever have thought for myself. And that's all I want for y'all. I'm not here to preach to y'all. I'm here because I want you to be able to understand how brilliant you are and, and what amazing things you can do when you're able to combine those two things together. The world is yours if you're able to do it. And it's easy to make the right decision. You know what I mean? That, that's all. I could. I could. I could. Yeah. You want to come up? Yeah. All right. Y'all pipe down. Was there ever a time when you was about to give up? And if it was, what was, what was it that kept you going? That's, that's a brilliant question. Like, every day you're going to come up against something that's going to make you think that you want to give up. Like, that, life is full of those. But um, what kept me going, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to sound corny or whatever, but what keeps me going to do the kind of work that I'm doing right now is this, like, talking to y'all. Because I, when I was in, so I'll give you an example. I, got, I went to RPI for grad school. It's a top science and engineering school. I got to the school, I'm the only black dude in the whole entire program, right? And, and I'm doing okay, and then all of a sudden, when I, I realized, hold up, um, I was never the smartest kid in school. Like, I'm not even here to try to stunt like, oh, I've always been super brilliant. I never was. Like, I could identify kids in my school who were way smarter than me. They got better grades than me. They, they like, the, the teachers liked them more than me. But I also remember these kids who, like, let's say somebody gave them a rap album today. Tomorrow, they got the whole album memorized. That, that takes brilliance. And I'm like, yo, how am I sitting here in this top engineering school, and I'm the only dude here, and there are all these other brilliant kids who don't have the same opportunity. So what keeps me going and doing this kind of work is understanding that hopefully I say something to one of y'all, they'll be like, yo, you know what? Maybe I could try to flip that. And that motivates me. Um, and then also, like, I always stay motivated by hip-hop. Believe it or not, like, hip-hop always motivates me. Like, lyrics. Like, when Kanye West was like, I can let the dream killers kill my self-esteem or use the arrogance as esteem to power my dreams. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to get them. Um, or even when I was writing my dissertation, a song like Every Day I'm Hustling by, by Rick Ross, even though, even though Rick Ross is a, you know, is a fraud, I say it on camera, right? But he's talking about hustling to, he's talking about hustling to sell weight, which will get you locked up, and I can hustle to get this degree to get me more bread. You know what I mean? So I take those lyrics that are, that are put in a negative context and apply that to something in my life to be positive, and that's how I make it through sometimes. <laughs> Um, I guess with something light before you go, um... How are we on time? We're decent on time. Um, so who's like, anybody, somebody gotta be beatbox. Anybody beatbox out here? We got another mic? Go ahead. I was, I was spitting loud enough. Um, let me see what I Money will always come. Anybody who chases money 
who just chases empty bread, that money comes and it goes. If you do what you love, you all, it always get replenished. You know what I'm saying? And so if you do what you love and do it the right way, you're always going to be fine. All right? Thank you guys so much, and I hope to stay in touch with you guys. So this is a, a series that's a permanent program here at Friendship. It's called, again, Real Talks at Friendship. It is a speaker series for you all to bring, that we will bring to you all to speak on your, not on your behalf, but to speak to you, to encourage you, to empower you, and that we hope that you take what is being done here and, and you apply it to your life. So we want to thank Christopher Emden, Dr. Emden. Also on the behalf of our founder and chairman, Mr. Uh, Donald Hintz, and the friendship community, we thank you all for being such a great audience. And again, I hope that you all will take this and use this and run with it. Thank you again. Oh, I'm sorry. I got one more. One more. Again, this program is a is a program that we just started. Um, we had we, you. you in April, we're going to have Kevin Powell that's going to come back. We'll send more information about him. And then we're going to have a speaker coming in, um, in May. And then again, back in the beginning of the school year in August and September. So it's going to be an ongoing process to bring um, some speakers to you all, OK? Thank you.